there's also some math in terms of historically as a country where we were and where we are now in terms of the government at least looking out for the worker to make sure that the conditions are safe, that the worker's being treated the right way. If you can, give a little context, I guess, from the 40s to where we are now on how there has been a sea change. So in the 1940s, when most of the laws we're talking about, like minimum wage, were first created, there was one inspector, I think, for every 10,000 places, right? And ultimately, these things depend on inspectors going around and looking at workplaces because, for the most part, workers themselves are too scared to come forward and file a complaint because they're afraid they'll be fired. Um, right now, the chance of a business in America be inspected for anything, child labor, overtime, minimum wage, any of that stuff, is one one thousandth of a percent, which means a company would have to be in business for a thousand years before they had even a one percent chance of being inspected. So you have laws that are on the books, but that are really meaningless in the, in the lives of people who are working hard and trying to make ends meet. The part that I never get is there are more and more people that now fall below the middle class that historically, as a part of a population, would. We all know that there's a greater gap between have and have nots, especially on the most affluent side than at any point in American history. But yet, where's the outrage, Professor? I don't understand that with more people that are getting shafted or at least being squeezed, why aren't they being more vocal? And with the midterms right now, at least at the polling the way it is right now, they're going to be voting against self-interest. Have you ever figured out why that is? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue, but one thing is that a lot, of what's, a lot of what politicians are voting for, they're not running on, right? There is no, I don't know of any politician who is running saying, I want to make it impossible for people to collect stolen wages. I want to make sure that waiters and waitresses can't work their way out of poverty. And what you have is a disjuncture between what the population thinks. So for instance, on a, on a bipartisan basis, a majority of Republicans, registered Republicans, are for raising the minimum wage. A majority of registered Republicans believe that everybody should have a right to some minimum number of paid sick days. But the politicians who get money from these big corporate lobbies vote differently even than their constituents. And part of the way they get away with it is not advertising what they're doing. So I don't think it's necessarily that people are knowingly voting against their self-interest. You know, most people work hard. They don't pay that much attention to politics. It seems boring. Most people probably don't know even who their state legislature legislator is. And so people are able to get away with things and do things that are in the interest of their donors and not necessarily in the interest of their voters. And finally, Professor, listen, the deck's always been stacked against a little guy. That's not a news flash, but we can trace a lot of the velocity behind this to really Citizens United, can't we? And how the dynamic change, it wasn't so much, you know, a government and a so political philosophical thing. You have now industries basically not just directing, but writing their own legislation that they want. Uh, that's right. Citizens United has been a sea change at the state level because it means that corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money. And what you see, if you look closely at something like ALEC, is that the same corporations that are writing the laws are then also often making contributions to those politicians to get elected, also funding the think tanks in the states that produce white papers and you know talking heads to go on TV shows, and also running ads on TV and radio to create support for whatever they want to create for. When you have an unlimited amount of money, you, have, you can have what they have, which is a very big, well-funded, well-coordinated campaign that for the most part, people don't know about and don't think, oh, this is what I'm voting for. Amazing. Uh, Professor, I really appreciate a few minutes. Gordon Lafer, again, thank you for the time. Thank you. Up next, Mayor Bill de Blasio fuming over the spin that local tabloids have put on an editorial about his wife. Now, he's demanding an apology, but the question is, did the First Lady create this media circus all on her own? Our panel weighs in when we come back.